Hey everyone, this is David at Finish Line Factory and here with my friend Stuart. We're at the Elliott Museum. They're a historic race car museum here in uh, Stuart, Florida. This month they're having a month-long uh, event called Octane and Opulence. Tonight is the reception and uh, we're going to go for a tour around the uh, entire museum. Check it out. They got some food, they got some hors d'oeuvres and uh, Stuart, we got the walking encyclopedia here and is going to tell us all about the race cars. So, Stu, you wanted to talk about this Lotus for us, right? I didn't want to talk about this Lotus. All right. So this is the Lotus 11. This is a Lotus 11 Series 2 Le Mans. It was designed by Colin Chapman and uh, Colin Dare in the late 1950s, early 1960s. So what this car is, is basically a super light monocoque chassis, which actually Lotus kind of pioneered the monocoque racing chassis. And it has a Coventry Climax FWB engine in it. It is a two valve per cylinder, single overhead cam, four cylinder, producing 145 horsepower. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, right? The car weighs less than a thousand pounds. And it is massive. It has a five speed Webster top loading transmission. These things were little rocket ships on magnesium wheels. They would put some hair on your chest, and they'd put hair on other parts, too, if you ever let them get out from under you. And I just think they're so gorgeous. I mean, look, it's a skirted race car. It has skirts. It's awesome. You know, the only thing better than this is, like, a 23. And we have a 23 at the Revs Institute. And I think that's the only thing prettier than this. But it's so cool with this this pod right behind the driver and the skirted wheels and the exposed rivets. This was built in a shed in England and it was designed to do one thing. It was designed to be as fast as a car could possibly be and it was. They were very quick. You know, and these are still vintage race to this day. They're very fantastic. The reason they skirted the car was it was a very early form of aerodynamic. They wanted the car to be as streamlined as possible, but you had to maintain a track and a wheelbase, and you needed a minimum wheel width. So the solution at the time to getting aerodynamics perfect was to put these skirts on the wheels. Now, these skirts are not removable. They are actually part of the body. To get to actually get the wheels out, you know, if you had to do a hub change or anything, the car has to go up in the air and the cowl, when you remove the cowl, then the skirts come with it. So they're not like Cadillacs where the skirts could pop off of the car. They're actually molded in. And, you know, once again, this car was all made by hand in a shed, basically in England by like four dudes. Um, interesting enough, Mike Costin and his buddy, um, I think his last name was Hadsworth, they both joined together later on in life and formed Cosworth, which still supplies electronics to Formula One and at one point supplied all the motors for Formula One. So that came out of Lotus. All right, so let's move on. What, uh, what do you want to hit next? Um, I think we should talk about this Tejero Jaguar. The Jag? We're going to check out the Jag. The Jag. The Jag. All right, so what do we have here? What do we have here, Stewie? I will show you a shield, and you will know the significance of this car. I have no idea what I'm looking at. A Curia Koss. It sounds very familiar. So a Curia Koss was a racing team. They did a lot with Cobras. They did a lot with Ferrari and Porsche and Alpha and Jaguar. So you know those signature white and blue Jags? that you see. Right, yeah. A Curia Koss. Ah. So this is a Jaguar CDE platform, as it's called, um, under a Tejero body. So it still has a 3.8 liter dual overhead cam in line six. Um, it still has that Jaguar four-speed manual transmission. Okay. It still has the triple Weber 45 millimeter deco carbs and it makes about 300 horsepower. How much does it weigh, do you think? Um, Probably not much. You know, I don't actually know. 1,900 pounds is what it says over there, which I believe it. It's an aluminum-bodied car, you know. So if you think about it, so this is 300 pounds lighter than a Miata, and it has double the horsepower. Yes. Well, triple the horsepower, technically, if you're talking about a stock Miata. Yeah, like an NA Miata is probably around... 110 horsepower. 110 horsepower. The NB is at 140. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it's damn. got about triple the power of an original Miata. 
and it weighs 300 pounds less. Yeah, that should fly. Uh, it's scary. No traction control, no nothing, obviously. I did know. Did you notice the modern quick release behind the vintage steering wheel? Oh, Let's zoom in on that. It's really interesting. Maybe it was added after the fact, probably by someone that actually wants to get Well, they still race the it, obviously. So, you yeah. know, modern just, just safety Just made driver equipment. changes or yeah. stuff like that. Modern you know, safety equipment. I think it's okay for even even vintage cars to be updated yes. know, as, uh, just for safety, especially if they're still did raced. You, did you let the viewers take a peek up her skirt? Let me take a look at that. Let's see if I can get in there. Uh, so what do we have there? Is that the engine? That probably. is the cam cover in the back. Yeah. Oh, cool. I wish you could really, you know, get a peek up there and see the valve cover. <laughs> yeah, I wish. Old, old Jag 3.8 valve covers are so cool. They really are. And hey, maybe later on we can uh, get someone to open the hood for us. Hopefully. So we've got an Aston Martin Aston here. Aston DBR2. DBR2. So what do we have here? we got the front-mounted 4.1 liter aluminum alloy inline six, 315 horsepower. Two valves per cylinder, dual overhead cams, 315 horsepower. They weigh about 1,800 pounds. Um, so this is your classic Le Mans race car. This is, you know, Le Mans 1950s. This is what you get. And mm. this is that classic sports car shape. And it's fantastic. You know the number lights that we have now yeah. in modern endurance racing? Yeah. Well, this is the way they used to do it. The reason we have a white roundel is because you can very easily reflect the light off of a white roundel. Right, okay. So they used to, at night, you would have to turn that light on and it would shine a light onto that roundel. That's your early number lighting system that we have now in uh, IMSA, WEC, most forms of, you know, GT endurance racing, but that's the way they used to do it. Yeah. Oh, and check this. Look how wide the transmission tunnel is. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, is yeah, the yeah. transmission actually that big? It's the transmission and the exhaust run through that tunnel. Ah, uh, I see. It makes sense. It so, makes sense. Also, that's why check so that out. The gated shifter. So the, yep. the shifter is in this box, and oh man, there's a handbrake there, and it's got a fire extinguisher next to you. Yep. So there's your there's your fire suppression system. And your, the hounds, your houndstooth interior. And did you notice your tachometer is larger than every other gauge in the vehicle? Because that's the one that matters the most. Yes, and your speedometer is all the way over here. Yeah, right? Because <laughs> it doesn't matter how fast you're going. No. Because uh, you should be looking at that and make sure you don't over rev the engine. Yeah. This thing is just so pretty. It's beautiful. Look at this. This is gorgeous. Kind of reminds me of like, a, like an E-Type without a roof. A little bit, yeah. It almost reminds you, I always used to say these reminded me of very, very pretty Cobras. Yes. And yeah, I see God, that. Barani wire wheels. Considering that um, the... Shelby Cobra, the AC Cobra is a British design, and this is a British car. Yeah. It makes sense. Beautiful Barani wire wheels. Oh my lord, I love a good wire wheel. Yeah. 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 So, so only, here we have the only Porsche in the collection. Which this I, is the only Porsche in the entire collection. Yes. You know, Porsche is a huge manufacturer, and they have a ton yes, of historic cars. Yeah. But this one is extremely special. Stewie, hit it. So this is a Porsche 550 Spider. Yes, this is the same type of car that James Dean died in. So these cars are not hopped up 356s. If you call it a hopped up 356, I'm gonna find you and come to your house. These are alloy bodied, space frame. Okay, so they're tube frame. And they're very, very gorgeous. They're trimmed like road cars. They really are. They're very, very gorgeous. I just love the interior on these, those classic green Porsche gauges. That classic banjo steering wheel, that's all very traditional Porsche. Now, the good stuff about this car, this car weighs 1,200 pounds. 1,200 pounds. 1,212 pounds is the official curve weight of a 550 Spider. But it's it's really not much, it's actually smaller than the Jag, but it weighs 700 pounds less. Yes, this is actually smaller than my Scion. How, how, where do they put all the weight? How do they get rid of it? Aluminum alloy. So all the and a tube frame. So the whole car is aluminum. But even I don't even think full carbon fiber DPI cars weigh that little because they're very big. Ah, yes, that is true. You also got to think. It's the like metal the on this car is very thin. Oh yeah. So if you get into a crash, uh, you're not going to have a good time. James Dean told us that. Um, Rest in peace. The cool stuff about this car 
is that it's still a four cylinder, so it's a flat four boxer, but Porsche did a little uh, black magic with their flat four. What they did is they took the engine and they said, we need more power. So they made a magnesium crankcase for the motor. And for the first time in their history, they fit dual overhead cams each side. This engine became known as the Type 547. You can still buy a Type 547 from Porsche. They're $256,000. That's a chunk? Yep. So it's a four cam, four cylinder, 1600 cc motor, okay, with Weber carbs, ignition, electronic, you know, multi-point ignition, and they make 110 horsepower. That's it? That's it. Well, if you only weigh two, uh, 1,200 pounds, you don't really need much you to get don't going. Much power. Think about it, you weigh 1,000 pounds less than a Miata, and you have the same power. Oh, hell yeah. So, and it's like doing spec Miata. The key with these cars was momentum, momentum, momentum. You always kept your foot in the floor, you know? And they were called giant killers for a reason. These cars would take on the Astons and the Jags of the day, and they would dominate them. They would decimate them. Oh, I bet. Because they were so light and they were so reliable that they could do all these big endurance races. And a lot of where they actually, you were asking about the weight, I, I just recalled, a lot of where they shaved the weight off of this car was, you look at stuff like the wheels and the drums, the wheels are magnesium. So, and this type of lug pattern is called a wide five. You can actually find this in your Beetle, in your 356, in your Volkswagen bus, wide five. So, and that's mounting directly to the brake drum. Wow. That's the brake drum directly behind it. And the reason they did that is that castle nut comes off and you can change the brakes very quickly. Oh, so when you're doing your um, your brake changes, you don't have to take the wheel off and nope. do all this stuff. It's just boom, right there. You take the wheel and the brake off at the same time. All right, so Stuart is now about seven champagnes in. Three. Three. It's Prosecco, not champagne, because it doesn't come from the champagne region of France. He has a... Uh, I'm wearing a cardigan. He's wearing a cardigan. And we're gonna go check out some more cars. Oh wow, there is. Oh, a Cunningham. What? <gasps> oh, re oh, okay. Stuart is surprised, so we're already off to a good start. So this is a, what is this thing? This is a Cunningham C3 Continental Cabriolet. Did, did, you, did you know that because you read it off of the? No, I knew it offhand because my family owned it. So you know this because your family owned one, and this is? 1960s. Very nice. Oh my god. Wow. I'm sorry. 1960, 12 hours of, or 1980, 12 hours of Sebring participant Kendall Vintage Grand Prix sticker on the glove box. So the owner of this car was Vintage a participant. Wait, no. They raced this Vintage car? Vintage raced it. Well, that makes sense because this is a race car museum. So they did it. This, wow. well, huh. This doesn't seem like a, like, a, like a race car. This seems more like a... Like a grand tour. This will make sense if you go to my if you go to finishlinefactory.com forward slash blog and look at my rambling man column. I'm going to ramble. So Briggs Cunningham was an American playboy. He was also a race car manufacturer. Briggs Cunningham made some of the most gorgeous race cars in the entire world, and he made them right here in my home in West Palm Beach off of 45th Street. This was Briggs Cunningham's road car. The C3 had a Hemi a Chrysler Hemi, and it had this gorgeous, gorgeous coachwork. I mean, it's just a classic shape. It's timeless, this gorgeous two-tone, the silver leather interior, like metallic silver leather. Like, come How on. How do you even do that? That is so cool. And I love the big gauges, and this car is so romantic, man, the big gauges and factory air conditioning and... They were just so cool. My family had a Cunningham C3 coupe in this exact color combination, and they were quick. These were, dare I say it? These were the BMW M5 of their day. All right, so check this out. So I was like, I was just coming up onto this car, and I see Stewart just freaking out. This is a completely original 1965 Porsche 356 C. Because I know that because that's what it says right here. Well. I also knew it by looking at the car, but you know. Tell us about the car. 356, Dr. Yeah. Ferdinand Porsche's first road car. 
So this is what started it all. It's not a hopped up Beetle. Um, this is a Porsche. It's rear engine, four cylinder. Um, so it's a single, it's a push rod actuated, I believe. Okay, four cylinder motor, flat four, just like a Beetle. Uh, a little more power than a Beetle. Uh, these actually have about 75 horsepower. Hang on a second. That's easier. You want me to start it over? No, you can keep up. going. Oh. So we don't we don't make jump cuts in this professional YouTube series. World class. World class. Editing is for bitches. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh, we got William here. I forgot to introduce him. <laughs> hey, it's William William Roger Cummings. He's a uh, real estate bro real estate broker, re agent. Thank you. He does he does real estate. <laughs> he does real estate in Palm Beach. If you need something, if you need a house, you look for him. So anyway, back to Stewart. So these are about 75 horsepower. They don't weigh all that much. I think they weigh about 1,700 pounds-ish. 1,600, 1,700 pounds. Really? Yep, they're very light. This is, was described as one of the most communicative sports cars to drive. I believe it. Um, they're very direct in the way they talk to you. And this is a 65. This is a 356C. Or, yeah, 356C. You know how you can tell? How's that? You come and you look at the back end. Well, ignore the fact that it says C on there, because normally they didn't say that. But what you would do is you would come, you would look at the license plate lights, okay? All right. And then you would look at the tail lights. 356Cs had this teardrop shape. 356As and 356As and Bs had what was called beehives. They looked like little beehives sticking out of the butt of the car. They wouldn't have had these reflectors. 356Bs also didn't have twin grills. They had a single grill. Ah, makes sense. And then 356As had a single grill split horizontally, not vertically. 356As are the most expensive, Bs being the next expensive. A 356C in this condition would garner about forty or fifty thousand dollars. Not bad. So Actually, you can have I could, a, you I could, could probably buy it. You could have a very vintage Porsche and be a proper PCA member for about forty thousand dollars. And they are, yes, you can track them very easily. These cars love to be tossed around. I've driven a 356. These cars love to be tossed around. All right, so we popped back over to the main showroom for a second because uh, we accidentally skipped over this Alpha while we were getting some food. Uh, so this is a 1964 Alfa Romeo Giulia TZ, and I know that because I read it on the sign. <laughs> so now, do Stewart, you know what a TZ stands for? Um, Tasmanian Devil. No, Touring Zagato. Touring Zagato. Okay. So it's an Alfa Romeo Giulia, but the body is by Zagato of Milan, Italy. So Zagato, you might know recently for doing a couple Aston Martins with those beautiful kind of shooting brake shapes on the back of them. This is what Zagato originally did. You can see some of that shooting brake shape in the rear of this. It's a very bobtail with a lot of glass on the rear hatch area. Oh, you know what? Stuart, I've seen this car before. I've seen yes. this car at the uh, Boca Raton Concourse. Yes. This is called the Camback. Yes. Yes. We have one of these in the Revs Institute. Funny enough. This is beautiful. So this, is a, this has a 1600cc dual overhead cam, four valve per cylinder, which for the time is very, very rare. Uh, four-cylinder engine. They make about 160 or 170 horsepower depending on what kind of fuel you put in them and they only weigh about 15 or 1600 pounds. They're very light. They're aluminum bodied. Five-speed manual transmission, engine way up front, and a pioneered Alfa Romeo transaxle. So like a Corvette, the transmission and the differential are all housed in one unique cast body to keep weight Way at the back and keep weight distributed because, as you know, we found out when the 240s transmission blew up, a transmission is pretty heavy. Yes, it is. And when you can keep all of that weight right here in the center of the car over the rear axle, you can actually balance the car a lot better. And that's why these cars were so dominant in sports car racing, is because their weight balance and the power and the power to weight ratio of these cars was absolutely fantastic. Not to mention it was an absolutely perfectly perfectly engineered chassis these make some of the best noises i've ever heard out of any mid-60s sports cars in my life i love these things to death and you know the rule there's no such thing as an ugly alfa romeo you saw the midget offy midget hey look at that thing offenhauser engines were used in those up uh, in indy cars up until the 1980s 
and they turbocharged them and made 1,500 horsepower out of it. 1,500 horsepower in that, in a, in a tin can. Holy shit. This is, this is not, this is a can of Campbell's soup. Oh, what? No way. Okay, so that's, I don't think that's a drive shot. I'm pretty sure that's a torque tube because that would be a little too ridiculous. Stuart, Stuart, yes. look at this thing. Yes. Look at this. Have you ever look, seen look an Offenhauser? No. Okay, then Is you're that, in for Please a tell surprise. me that's a torque tube and not a drive shaft. That's a drive shaft. That's a drive shaft. Yes. That actually turns. Yes. The entire thing turns. Yes. So, Stuart, let me just let me just make sure I get this straight. So, you are sitting yes. in this Campbell soup can. Yes. Um, with the transmission between your legs. Yes. And the shifter between your legs. Yes. Right next to your nuts. Yes. The drive shaft is rotating directly under you. Yes. And you're... And this thing has 1,500 horsepower. Capable. This thing is does not have 1,500 horsepower. This thing has more like 200, 300, something Still, like that. Still, in a, in a car that probably weighs like less than 1,000 pounds. I mean, yes. look at this thing. There's nothing to it. Well, the tires are about as big as the tires on my lawnmower, so. So um, it has 300 horsepower to the rear wheels in something, this, in something the size of your, with lawnmower tires, yes. basically. About 200. The, I just, all I want to know is how, how did the driver fit into that seat well, with the size of his balls? Let me explain Let me explain something to you. The shifter placement isn't that weird. So when you're driving, it would be... Let me do the animation here. I would tilt the Hang camera a down a little bit. So the animation would be you'd be driving, and it would be first, second, third, and then fourth, and then you wouldn't touch the shifter because you're doing an oval. Ah, uh, okay. So you really only shift like... Three times and that's it. Once Coming you get to fourth, that's it. So first, second, third, fourth. And ah, I see. And then you you're off the shifter. But these this is a midget offy. That's the thing to remember. This is not a full fledged indie race car. Um, you know, this is a race car, but it's a midget race car. So they're very tiny. They have a decent amount of power. They're not as lively as the real indie off the real indie offies with their big four cylinder twin cam motors would definitely make later on in the 80s, as uh, Jorgensen Eagle would prove to us, as Dan Gurney would uh, soon do. They would make 1,500 horsepower with some turbocharging and uh, methanol. Lots of methanol. There's a great video out there. Search Rick Mears methanol fire. Yes, I remember that. I remember that. I see that so video. If you don't know, methanol burns with a clear flame. And there's a photo of Rick Mears coming into the pits. His fuel guy links the hose up to the car, and you see immediately he pulls the hose out, he drops the hose, and you see everybody in the pit start doing this. There's no visible flame, but everybody is burning. It's a methanol fire, and they are extremely dangerous. But you made 1,500 horsepower. And that's why methanol is banned in motorsports. Exactly. That's why methanol is banned. All right, everyone. Well, that concludes our visit to the Elliott Museum. I appreciate the invitation to come and check out all of these beautiful cars. Uh, mm -hmm. Stuart, do you have any final words to say before we uh, close it out? If you live anywhere in South Florida and you can get to this museum easily, do it. It's, do it. uh, it's a cool collection. Um, there are some incredible cars here. Yeah, and all the staff is super friendly. Oh, my God. And yes. um, the Aston is way prettier in person. I'm just going to say that. Yes, all you of know. these cars, they look really good on camera, but you need they to experience in them person. in person. Yeah. So come check out the Elliott Museum. I'll have the, their uh, information, their website, their address on the, in the uh, description below. And thank you guys for watching. Catch you guys later. Bye. Peace.